Nevertheless, I'm sticking to my point and saying that this is basically the end of the neocon, neoliberal, um, or coming to an end, sort of state capture of Georgia. It is important to remember that what they are asking of Georgia, what they expect of Georgia, for them is the most important thing. What they want Georgia to, to be is not a democratic democracy, a neoliberal, a liberal run state, a state that's friendly to the West. They specifically want Georgia to be antagonistic, to be hostile to Russia. This is the problem. If you are not hostile to Russia, if you want to maintain good relations to Russia, then from the near neocon perspective, you are not a friend of the West. It is either with us 100% or we are against you. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I have a special round again with my dear colleagues, Lasha Kasarate and Alexander Mercuris. I'm pretty sure most of you know both of them. Lasha is a Georgian national in the US, uh, working with and for the Sokumi State University. And Alexander Mercuris, I think, needs no introduction. He is one of the two uh, great brains behind the Duran. He has his own channel on which he does daily one to one and a half hours our uh, discussions of current affairs. Uh, everybody, uh, please check him out. His, uh, his insights are fantastic. And today we want to discuss what's happening in Georgia because it's a crazy week. It's a crazy week. Uh, Lasha Alexander, what, what are your thoughts so far, not just of Georgia, but of what's happening around us within the last seven days? It, it, there is a sense of something absolutely frenetic going on. It's as if um, we're in a period of transition from one administration of the United States to another, from one time period to another, because the election in the United States itself does seem to be consequential in some form. And one almost one gets the sense, I mean, you know, to... <laughs> misquote Gramsci again, as everybody does in these situations, that in this time of transition, all sorts of things happen. All sorts of people are manoeuvring for positions. In Syria, we've seen an attempt to revive the civil war, an attack on Aleppo, which clearly caught the government um, by surprise. Um, we've seen a crisis in South Korea, which is came completely out of nowhere because nobody in the international you know, viewing people like us, I think we're expecting this. I mean, we were aware, I think, that the situation in South Korea was not entirely, you know, happy, that the president was unpopular, that the parliament was critical of him. But, you know, nobody expected a flare up in South Korea of all places. We've had also um, a very dangerous series of escalations in Ukraine, uh, which I know you've already We've all been talking about in various formats. And then, of course, we have the topic that we're going to discuss in this programme today, which is what's going on in Georgia. And it's a small country. It's in the Caucasus. It is attracting an incredible amount of attention. It's the top, the subject, by the way, of an editorial in The Guardian <laughs> this evening. So, I mean, you know, the even The Guardian, you know, the... Me, the uh, European Union, the United States, they're all worrying and, well, not worrying, they're all very angry about, or say that they're very angry about what's going on in Georgia. And they're clearly supporting one side in the conflict against another. Now, before we proceed, just on the Georgia events, I would like to make one point, which is that the government in Georgia is being criticised for undermining democracy. There's been strong statements about this from the United States and the European Union. There have been sanctions both threatened and apparently brought in against members of the government. Notice that throughout the crisis in South Korea, which has been playing out for several hours, the United States specifically, which has an enormous influence in South Korea, has had little to nothing to say at all. The South Korean president comes out, he's going to dissolve the 
parliament. He's going to close down the media. He's going to ban strikes. He's going to do all of these things. He sends the army into the parliament building. He, in other words, acts in a far more authoritarian way than the government in Georgia has done. But the United States, the administration in Washington, have they criticized it? Did they express concern? Did they threaten the president with sanctions? Nothing of that kind at all. Now, that might be a clue as to, uh, you know, the background to the events in South Korea. But you can see you can see a, a, a sharp distant difference in the way in which uh, the United States and its friends, the so-called international community, which is the United States and its friends, have responded to these two crises. The very great difference between the two. Wonderful observation. And um, we learn time and again, it's not the act that matters, it's who does it. Uh, but yeah. uh, Lasha, uh, you are looking at Georgia very closely because because this is your home country, right? You're in touch with, with the people there. Um, the framing of this being, being somehow an anti-democratic uh, moment of Georgia, right after the elections, right after <laughs> it was confirmed that the, the governing, the, the biggest party, again, won the biggest chair, more or less something that was maybe not not obvious but no, no it was it was kind of expected i mean or like it could have uh, tipped the other way but it could have stayed this way and it did um what what do you make out of this and where are we today as we speak on this uh thursday evening in the u.s uh, wednesday well, evening? let me tell you chaos is all around us uh so but gentlemen thank you very much once for doing this once again alexander pascal um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, what do you, Georgia is like a C student, is a D student. He's, it's, it's always something that, that the West is not satisfied with. Um, the association agreement done under this government, uh, the visa-free travel done under this uh, government, uh, the current GD, um, number of other success stories in terms of deepening the relations with, with the EU being done under this government. Um, even right now, total claim by uh, the prime minister uh, saying that if there is any issue with what's happening, give us the contract. I'm willing to sign it right now. Give us the give us the final document for accession. I'm willing to sign it. So, but no, nothing is enough. Um, so what's happening is basically, uh, you know, uh, is, is the um, coming to an end of the neoconservative sort of state capture in Georgia. Uh, that's my take on it. Um, I've never said, for example, I just wanted to sort of reiterate uh, that point that this wasn't this this would not be painful or this was going to go smoothly just because things have changed both internationally and, and therefore regionally. Uh, but um, nevertheless, I'm sticking to my point and saying that this is basically the end of the neocon, neoliberal um, or coming to an end sort of state capture of Georgia. And I cannot emphasize more uh, how important the fact that um, this is unprecedented. What makes it unprecedented is what the GD has done. They basically have said enough is enough. And with the um, uh, and so let me just rewind just slightly. We remember NGO law sort of kicked in and triggered this. Uh, there were a few uh, back and forth uh, uh, that was going on before that as well. But the NGO law adoption of the foreign agents law really, uh, uh, really pissed off uh, sort of uh, you know uh, folks in Brussels and and in Washington. And after that, even even when you know, European Union, France, uh, you know, the United States, of course, they all have the same, basically the same law. Uh, for some reason, the Georgian law is not, you know, was not enough, was not acceptable. Um, why? Because it really started to check uh, their arm, their sort of strategic arm uh, on the ground, the NGO sector. And they didn't want that. They didn't like it. Um and so that grew into what we are seeing today with 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 Prime Minister uh, uh, basically saying that um, uh, you know uh, you know 
Georgia's the, the statement could have been crafted better. Uh, perhaps you would agree with me, uh, Pascal Alexander. I mean, you know, it should have been a more deft sort of political approach uh, on, on behalf uh, on part of the current government. But uh, be that as it may, uh, they, he said, well, the collective list basically said that, um, uh, you know, Georgia was going to halt uh, negotiations or the conversation or the dialogue with the European mm -hmm. Union until 2028. Uh, and in the meantime, however, it's very important, they were going to continue on with all the reforms that had already been uh, mm -hmm. told and sort of push down their throats. Uh, so they're, they're mostly they're they're very much willing uh, to pursue these uh, these policies that, that, that the EU is requesting. Uh, and real quick, um, the the current situation, this this chaos that we're witnessing, it is it lacks substance. This is not the same dynamic that we saw in, back in 2003 when Saakashvili was in power. And what I mean here is um, it, you know, sort of Washington and Brussels do not have either a group of people or an individual around mm. whom they can craft this message all over again. This this sort of, uh, uh, you know, this uh, a color revolution uh, message, mm. uh, uh, you know, freedom message, democracy mm. message, because uh, in, a, in, a, in a very smart way, I think the current government sort of dissected all, all those messages, all those narratives, mm. and perhaps controversially, perhaps with um, uh, sort of a la lack of diplomatic skills, but nevertheless, they actually called mm -hmm. the bluff and they know, so Georgia is in a way, is, is in, in for a, a rude awakening of what has been imposed on it for, throughout these past 15 years. So in, so from that angle, uh, I don't think, I don't think that uh, Brussels uh, and, and, and Washington have much uh, to go with other than just to provoke mm -hmm. this, by the way, very young kids. I think this is college age, if not high school age kids that are mainly uh, out in the streets. Uh, so that's sort of the, empty, hollow aspect of it that that I think uh, will not sort of grow into something more substantial. But um, we there is this this very destructive president, actually, the former French ambassador, former Fre a French citizen who is currently the uh, 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 president of, of uh, Georgia and will will stay so until the end of this month. And she has come out as a forceful voice within the structure. And it seems to me that she's being propped up as, you know, the next the, the, the uh, a possible next leader. Mm -hmm. But maybe you're right. Alexander, does this remind you of what we've seen in the Maidan? And and how Ukraine went down, and are you as optimistic as Lasha in the sense that there it, it's not of substance in order to carry forward? I'm very well, cautious, this... optimistic, very cautious. Right. Well, the, the thing to say is, of course, I am not present physically in Tbilisi, so I can't assess the size of the crowds um, or, 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 or the depth of support of the protests. My feeling is that they are not widely supported within Georgian society. They do seem to me to be mostly confined to Tbilisi. And so far, attempts to uh, organise major strikes and involve you know, people, organised labour or whatever it is, th that hasn't worked. However, the same was true, and this is a thing which people tend to forget, the same was true for most of the early period of the Maidan protests. Again, they were confined to Ukraine, there were attempts to organize general strikes, which were completely unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. It seemed, in fact, for a long time, as I well remember, as if the protests were getting smaller, even as they also began to grow more violent, which is a similar pattern that we see in Georgia. So one can't assume that this isn't going to lead to something. There is one absolutely critical difference, one absolutely fundamental difference between the situation in Ukraine and the situation in Georgia. And that is in the attitude and policies of the government. In Ukraine, the Yanukovych government bent over backwards to try to find some kind of an accommodation with the protesters in Maidan Square. So it criticized the police, it sacked senior police officials, it supported prosecutions, of police officers, thereby ultimately demoralizing the police. It ended into constant negotiations with the protesters, looking for kind of ways forward. 
It allowed them to occupy public buildings. It allowed them to set up ten cities in the center of um, uh, of Kiev, and of course Yanukovych himself spent an extraordinary amount of time on the telephone talking to Western leaders, most specifically to the Vice President of the United States, who was Joe Biden. And that has not happened in Tbilisi this time. The government has taken a much firmer line with respect to the protests. It's made it absolutely clear that it's not going to negotiate with the protesters. It is not going to accede to their demands. It has shown no hesitation in letting the uh, uh, police clear streets and squares of the protesters. It's made it also clear that it will take steps, you know, within the law to defend public order. So it's it's a very different situation in that respect. Now, given that the government has just won an election, has a very high degree of support, or so it seems, within Georgian society. My my own sense is that provided the government not only continues along this course, but critically provided it remains united. If Georgian dream is able to remain united, then it will see this process through. The risk is that people will start to defect. There'll be MPs who start to leave and say that the police are overreacting. Uh, We start to get police officials who start to get nervous and start to back off. If, If things like that start to happen, then it is possible that the whole thing could get out of control. But for the moment, that isn't happening. And coming back to what you were saying, Pascal, my own sense is that the key moment will be what will happen when the current president's term finally expires. If she is presumably escorted out of her office at that time and a new incumbent president takes over, then I think that will be seen as a signal by Georgian society, including many of these protesters, that this attempt at a colour revolution has failed. And at that point, I suspect that with the Christmas holiday coming, at that point, the protests will begin to run down. But this remains a dangerous time, and a lot depends on the discipline of the government, the unity of the party, the the Georgia Dream Party, and um, its ability to hold together in the face of what is, to be straightforward about it, a great deal of pressure. So that's my that's my points. Uh, Lasha, so from your experience, like how well, how big is the actual support for the Georgia Dream government? I mean, okay, they have a majority, but the majority is not everything of the population. It's absolutely normal for countries to have like several parties and factions and be disagreements of how things go. What is not normal is when that, when those things then become violent, right? So, um, but also within the, the opposition, we know this opposition is split into at least four major parts. Uh, how does that one then impact? impact who's on the streets and we've seen on the streets people who just protest we've seen people who are probably who are coming from abroad we've seen that on on twitter italian protesters who go there but we also see in uh, genuine protests and we see even people with like rocket like uh, firework launchers multiple i don't know how they build that stuff but what is your sense of this of these the group supporting the government and the group being on the streets Yes, excellent question. So here is what perhaps outside of Georgia observers, you know, Western analysts don't quite understand because they view this as the fight against, you know, tyranny and, you know, tyranny versus freedom and democracy, right? These are the sort of binary uh, sort of superficial ways we craft uh, what's happening, you know, outside of the United States every time we see something like that. Uh, Nothing could be further from the truth. What's happening in Georgia is... Uh, the opposition that has spawned from 
the United National Movement, everyone around, everyone today protesting, basically one way, directly or indirectly, is associated with the United National Movement. That's the basic driver of it. They 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 changed it, they modified it, they called dif themselves different names. That means little to nothing. Uh, the ideology, uh, the subservience to the establishment in the West. Uh, uh, there are compromising, uh, irrational, sort of radical behavior. All of that is sort of spewing out of, uh, uh, is, uh, coming out of the tradition of the United National Movement and, and the way they're ruled, um, sort of the darlings of the West. And by the way, they just still have not accepted the fact that even Washington has wiped its hands off of them. So, but they're basically, if you ask me, they're completely alone. Um, uh, you know, but um, they just don't want to accept the fact. Now, in terms of the win, it is absolutely uh, obvious that the Georgian dream won 54%. And to this day, they've been asking, come on in and let's talk. Let's use the building called the parliament and let's just discuss what it, what is it that you, what, what your grievances are. How can we move forward? That was basically um, uh, sort of um, the political approach that they adapted for a while there. But then being you know, in the environment of this, uh, you know, radical, you know, inheritance of this radicalism, it's, it's it's impossible to reason with the opposition. I hate to say this as an observer because it's the last thing you want to say in politics. I mean, you you need healthy opposition, and I I would support, you know, immediately if someone, you know, reasonable, uh, you know, came along and said we should work with the results that we've got and we should continue on with the political life in Georgia. Um, so in that respect, uh, you know, in my in my opinion, uh, you know, the, you know, um, uh, I believe that the opposition stands on very shaky grounds. I mean, they have they they've really dug grave dug the grave for themselves, um, uh, and so they're their own worst enemy in, in that sense. Uh, no one here is saying that GD is made up of a bunch of angels. Uh, they have made plenty of mistakes, both internally and in foreign policy. I've always maintained on these shows that. Uh, on average, I've always supported the foreign policy of the GD because, uh, you know, because of their pragmatic sort of, uh, uh, you know, self-survival based uh, foreign policy, especially towards Russia, because, you know, you know, you know Georgia has no problems with any other country there uh, in the region. Um, and they're still calling for the European Union and uh, the United States to accept them as such, just to allow them to survive along the road, along the way. Um, and that's not enough. Um, and I already listed. Uh, I already listed what the uh, accomplishments, concrete accomplishments that the GD uh, uh, had uh, throughout these twelve years. Uh, you know, you cannot escape the fact that they, they, they you know, under their government, they, they've gotten closer with, to the uh, European Union. Um, but uh, you know, it's just it's even you know, starting from the NGO laws laws to this you know to this refusal to accept the legitimacy of the elections without shred of evidence. By the way, if there were some violations, fine. I think the GD has said numerous times uh, that they were willing to look at it and they were willing to uh, you know uh, analyze the defects of the election. And I believe, uh, I think I mentioned this uh, with you, Pascal, um, in one of the earlier recordings, that uh, the, this, the U.S. State Department said, uh, told the Salome Zurabishvili, the president, to take up any proof that she might have and take it to the prosecutor's office and demonstrate what she, what is it what, what it is that they're complaining about. None of that happened. Um, so we see this pattern, this this ideologically driven pattern, because that's all it is. It's, it, they don't they couldn't care less about facts and evidence, um, uh, and so that's the dynamic. Now, to briefly return to the election results, yes, they won, but then again, um, they, they're basically been asking, is there any way that you guys can come up with the proof? Otherwise, we're going to have to move forward. And now, uh, basically, every uh, known famous opposition leader has been delegitimized. De de and so my sense is that they're sort of tr shifting their that, that political narrative uh, and the ideology onto the younger generation who can be very easily manipulated. Um, but uh, I will return to my main sort of point and say that they just do not have substance. They don't have, what can they do? 
in the worst case scenario, um, uh, if if they decide to um, if, if this blows up and and becomes wider and deeper um, uh, and sort of takes the shape of another color revolution, um, I, there is always that Russian factor that we must we must also keep in mind. I, I, I always say that I, you know, I just don't think that the, you know Moscow will allow another rose revolution in them when uh, it took you know two thousand and eight to prevent uh, you know NATO expansion and it took uh, you know you know all kinds of sort of uh, Russian politicking to prevent any other uh, uh, you know color revolutions uh, in in its periphery. Um, so perhaps we can also touch on that. Uh, but that's yeah, that's. I Let's let's do that. The foreign factor, and one one thing is that is sure is that the media gear in the West really really uh, I mean came up and and is now in full swing, right? The portrayal, if you watch DW, if you watch CNN or BBC, is very very clear. It is authoritarian pro Russian government versus uh, underdog democ uh, pro democracy pro European Union. It it is it is quite insane. And Jeffrey Sachs uh, sometimes says, you know, Washington cannot take yes for an answer. And it seems to me this is what's happening with Georgia. Georgia is not doing enough of what it wants. Therefore. Um, there, something needs to be done. We've seen foreign influence, but Alexander, what do you think is this influence now, the NGOs or the influence that the neocons still do have in Georgia? And B, what uh, Lasha just said, what yeah. do you think the Russians are thinking to themselves right now watching that uh, this thing unfold? Well, the, the, the Russians will watch and wait, uh, for the moment at least. I, I think they understand that if they were to intervene or appear to intervene in Georgia at this particular time, it would not go well either for Georgia Dream or or for the general situation there. So they will watch and wait and they will see. Of course, if the events that we see play out and lead to a colour revolution and the current government is replaced by the people that Lasha was talking about, then the, then the Russians will react. And I think one of the steps they might take, and this is something that perhaps people in Georgia might want to think about is that they might actually not only reinforce their positions in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, but they might start making moves to actually join South Ossetia specifically to North Ossetia, in other words, to bring South Ossetia into the Russian Federation, which I suspect would have some support in South Ossetia as well. So that would that might happen fairly fast. Now, Going back to the things you said, I think the most important thing to understand is that, yes, people, the Americans, the neocons, find it very difficult to take yes for an answer, as Jack, exactly as Professor Sachs says. But it is important to remember that what they are asking of Georgia, what they expect of Georgia, for them is the most important thing. What they want Georgia to, to be is not a democratic democracy, a neoliberal, a liberal run state, a state that's friendly to the West. They specifically want Georgia to be antagonistic, to be hostile to Russia. This is the problem. If you are not hostile to Russia, if you want to maintain good relations to Russia, then from the near neocon perspective, you are not a friend of the West. It is either with us 100% or we are against you 100%. That, unfortunately, tragically, is the line the neocons and the neocon establishment in the United States always takes. Now, there are lots of people right across every nation in Eastern and Central Europe and indeed even in Russia itself, in fact, definitely in Russia itself, who are very influenced indeed by the lure of Western um, success, American prosperity, Western narratives and propaganda. These are very well resourced. There are all kinds of agencies that promote them. We discussed them in our previous program. There's the NGOs, there's the media, there are all of these things. Inevitably, there are going to be quite a lot of people, especially young people, who are influenced and drawn by these things. And of course, young people in particular um, believe in freedom and democracy and those kind of things. It's 
a lot of this appeals, what I mean, is to their idealism. And there is an element of that always in these protests. And then always in every country, there are also those people who have grievances, who are angry with the government for some reason. In every country, there are people who are going to be angry and embittered with the government. They won't like its policies because they don't like its tax policy, or they think the inflation has been too high, or they think this and they think that. And you can always pull and find people like that and draw them together and make a very substantial number of people who will be angry. And if you are well enough organized, you might even be able to make them into a crowd. The question is not whether those people exist. They always exist. The question is, <clears throat> is there a critical mass of them large enough to threaten the overall stability of the country? I suspect that the answer in Georgia at this particular point in time is no. But that this is something I see from a distance. Um, in Russia, for example, I can say definitely that that critical mass does not exist. I think probably it doesn't in Georgia either. But again, this is something that I suspect Russia is able to discuss and explain better than I have done. And I think to a great extent he already has, actually. Yeah, but let's let's ask him that again. And also the second mm -hmm. point, which is important in this kind of situation, is like, how about the men and women on their arms, specifically the police yeah. and the military? Um, yeah, are well, these indeed. two institutions, you know, well within, uh, well, I mean, the, the, ideologically the, under control? This is, this. Is, can I just quickly say, this is a critical factor, because in many cases where color revolutions have succeeded, it's, it's because either the government has collapsed i mean it's divisions and we've seen defections from it all because police agencies especially or military agencies break away uh, and refuse to obey orders and side with the opposition and of course if that starts to happen then there is a slide uh, this is again lasha is more yeah. informed yeah. about the situation than me lasha yes no that's fine um on the last point, real quick, and then I'll uh, um, sort of um, uh, address what you said earlier. Um, it's been actually uh, surprisingly well organized how the current government sort of handled both how, the trust between the police and the government uh, and, and uh, uh, the middle of military. There were, I think, a couple of radical extreme suggestions uh, that I think basically were ignored to use military, but I think basically it has been the police officers uh, and the internal affairs uh, folks that have been handling this. Uh, um, and one of the problems has always been um, sort of if Georgian cops beat up somebody, that looks like, um, uh, you know, a major statewide terror. Um, and yet you have much worse scenarios, say, unfold during riots, say, in France or in, you know, in, 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 in the core of Europe that nobody talks about, right? But, um, uh, but be that as it may, I, I I don't condone violence in that way. And if there is, uh, you know, let let experts and let professionals handle it. But if there is a way to avoid uh, any any violence uh, against, uh, you know, basically, you know, peaceful uh, protesters, then that should that should happen. Um, uh, and it should be very closely watched. Uh, but um, um, Alexander, if I may just go back to your point about idealism there, and as and as I understood, you were talking about some sort of a middle ground, right? Middle uh, layer of the population that does not exist either in 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 Russia or in or in Georgia. Is that I, did I understand it correctly? Well, 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 I mean, there there are always going to be some young people who will yeah. uh, you know imbibe the message that they get from the West and the radio stations, oh, yes. and the newspapers, and they will believe it. I, I don't know how many of them there are, but there are always some people like that. Um, I, I'm I'm not suggesting that there is significant uh, that there is significant proportion of the population, but they might be a significant pr proportion of the people who are currently protesting. They might not be the most violent protesters, many of whom undoubtedly I suspect are organised people, 
but there will be some of them there the people who go out and stay out to, into the night who accept the cold and all, all of that because they really do believe that they're fighting for freedom and democracy even sure. though they're not <laughs> to said to there was a radical there, there was a, a radical side to all this but then i've yeah. always said look if there are people out there who even my friends relatives whoever who just genuinely believe objectively where Georgia should go and avoid all the other sort of fanatical radicalization uh, of it. You know, that's what Georgia is all about, basically, for the past 2,500 years, wanting wanting to be accepted in the West. Uh, so I'm, I'm all for the idea of citizens basically charting their own course uh, for the country uh, in a democratic society. Uh, and speaking of idealism, this is, I mean, from, you know, even, you know, I don't mean to be all technical here but you know from from you know morgenthau to eh Carr, i mean these are like card carrying realists but they've always talked about how important idealism is it just when it comes to the sort of uh the, you know the only 11th hour you need that realist thinking you need that realist logic but idealism of course is you know you don't want to sort of dry yourself out being sort of and blindfold yourself into realist view of things. Uh, you, you do need idealism as a motivating factor, as a as a as a uh, you know as a mechanism with which to sort of view the world around you. Uh, but that's not what's been happening in in, in Georgia. In Georgia, I know idealism has turned into uh, fanaticism, radicalism. Mm -hmm. It's either you are pro-Russian or you are pro you know mm -hmm. some Washington think tank, and so that's has been the tragedy of this whole thing not not that citizens to, to go back to your point want to come out and say mm. look you know you know yeah. it might be assured politics to make peace with mm. russia but then look there are other issues that we have to work on and i'm still waiting for the day by the way when they say you know what this is you know we want increase in salary so we want you know more jobs so yeah. this is not what we're talking about we're talking about some blind you know, radicalization based off of narratives yeah. that just want to have, you know, a zero sum approach, absolutism, basically, we are witnessing. Uh, and, um, you know, that's that's been the story of Georgia for the past 30 years, and especially in the past 15 years. So, but, yeah. One of the infuriating things is that the Georgia Dream government doesn't even have diplomatic relations with Russia. It doesn't. It doesn't seek to just give up right. all the the the, uh, mm. the territories to Russia. It wants them back. The Georgia Dream government actually has its own anti-Russian propaganda, but that is not enough. I mean, Alexander, um, this the framing of what is happening um, <clears throat> isn't there a danger that this is so far removed from what is actually happening that then the West that there will be a really difficult time to explain why things aren't unfolding as they are expected. Um, I mean, okay, this is uh, uh, conjecture mm. into the future, but it seems to me that the international narrative about it, I mean, in the West, and the actual how things on the ground are far removed from each other. Or what's your impression? Oh, they're completely, they're completely uh, different from each other. I mean, there, there is the country you read about in the media <laughs> where uh, a tyrannical government is facing a heroic protest <laughs> by brave protesters. And then there is the actual reality on the ground in Georgia, which is completely different. There's no resemblance to that at all. This is a propaganda narrative. I think this is the thing to understand. And propaganda, of course, is always manipulative and always distortive. And in this case, it's absolutely completely false. And since we are talking about Georgia, the fact that it is false is one reason why more likely than not, in the end, this is going to fail. Because most Georgians, one must assume, can see that this is false. They are aware of the very things that you pointed out, that this supposedly pro-Russian government has been in power for 15 years and there's not been diplomatic relations established with Russia throughout all that time. So, it, it, and, you know, this pro-Russian government wants to see South Ossetia and Abkhazia brought back under Georgian control. So it's it's something which presumably one assumes most Georgians can see, and which explains why, for the moment, the protests in Georgia have not attracted that critical mass of protesters that are needed.
in order to bring the whole thing cascading down. Um, and I think that is how it will stay, provided, as I said, the government remains united. And mm -hmm. as you correctly said, the security forces remain loyal to the constitutional and legal order which the government represents. So far, they have done so. And there's no obvious reason by this point why they should change sides. And the government has made it clear that it supports the security forces in the lawful steps that they are taking. And the government also seems to have understood, seems to understand very well that it mustn't it mustn't overreact to these protests. It mustn't do what Lukashenko did, for example, at the start of the 2020 protests in uh, in Minsk, when he actually went, his, his security forces uh, reacted with excessive violence against the protesters, which did make them for a time appear victims and did manage to radicalize and win over a significant part of the population for a temporary period over to their side. So they have so far, I would say, got the, the balance about right. They've left it to the police. They've left it to the security forces. They've not overreacted. They've kept the army in barracks, which is the right thing to do. And provided, as I said, they continue on this way, sooner or later, this thing will uh, run its course. In Ukraine, the thing that in the end tipped the scale was the mass shooting on the Maidan, these 100 people that died. And we know, thanks to the research of Ivan Kachanovsky, himself a Ukrainian in Canada, uh, who researched this extensively, we know now these shots were fired from the pro-Maidan side. These shots were fired by ultra-right-wing uh, elements. And uh, Lasha, is there any danger? Are there any similar groups of these, like, kind of neo-Nazi groups that, that Ukraine had, which in the end were able through extreme violence tip the scale. And, you know, we know that, you know, bloodshed is the one of the most um, um, powerful propaganda uh, methods. Are you afraid of anything like this or not? Yes, no, no, no. Uh, there is always a danger of that in Georgia, always. Uh, uh, emboldened by Maidan, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, misunderstanding, miscalculation might happen, um, some tragedy might result, and that could become uh, a sort of a, a pretext for uh, either overthrowing the government or, you know, or, or just uh, or this going to, to the next level. Uh, there is, of course, there is danger for that. Uh, but so far, uh, the probability, I mean, it doesn't seem to be based on the observations and how how events have been unfolding uh, that we could um, sort of um, go with that possibility. It's certainly a possibility, but the probability of that at this stage, at least, I think, uh, is uh, is low, you know, fortunately. Uh, but there is always that danger. Um, and, and this time around, if it escalates, it won't be so peaceful as the Rose Revolution, if you will. Uh, you know, it, so yeah, th there is there is the danger. But so far, luckily, I think the government has been handling it. Um, quite well and there is that very sort of key component to it the absence of substance the absence of the real core sort of uh, um uh sort of mechanism with which they 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 can continue this and i because they have no claim they have you no know, on the election front they've never been able to make their case on the european uh on joining the eu front they've never been able to make their case um so it's just it has just been um uh, you know again narrative driven ideologically uh driven uh propaganda like alexander said uh driven um sort of uh, movement um not much else. And yet it's still chaos. It's still dangerous. And this government is not out of the woods yet. Um, I, I, I would just quickly add that one of the fundamental reasons that happened in Maidan Square was because the government mishandled the protests. I mean, it allowed the protesters to gain control of an area of central Kiev, which they were able to occupy, Maidan Square, which they were able to occupy for months. It enabled, it allowed them to occupy various buildings around the square. It uh, sat by as they appointed a commander and a special paramilitary force in Maidan Square. So it, it set up, in effect, 
all the circumstances that made it possible to organize a military and violent group <laughs> that was able to do the things that Professor Kachanovsky has so uh, thoroughly investigated. Now, the government in Tbilisi is not letting that happen. And that is a crucial difference. That doesn't mean it won't happen. And it doesn't mean that something like that won't be tried. But for the moment, they've understood, I think, the dangers. They probably learned a lot from what actually happened um, in Maidan in 2013 and 2014 in Ukraine. And that's why they're avoiding these, um, these, these developments. We've seen them successfully avoid these developments up to this point. Yes. Yes. This, um, we've reached the 40 minute mark and I want to be mindful of your time. Um, any any last point that any, any one of you want to make? I, I'm going to leave it to, to Lasha. He's there. <laughs> it's his <Sure>. country. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so I think I've said this before that um, if, look, if Ivanishvili's government, right, if, you know, let's be honest here, he will, you know, the power behind the scenes. Um, and uh, the, if the Georgian dream had agreed to open up the second front, they would have all gotten Nobel Prize for fighting freedom. For, for, for You know, this is so, I, this th that's how ironic this whole situation is, right? They would have said, oh, here are the freedom, freedom fighters. He would have been invited to Washington, D.C., right? Um, you know, he would be basically whisked, you know, so paraded around the free world. Um, but as long as you defend your principles, the interests of your country, and, you know, you do not want to be used as a battering ram against uh, a, a major power, uh, you don't want to be suicidal, basically. No, you are pro-Russian and you're not, uh, you are turning, uh, turning your back, um, uh, you know, against uh, Washington and Brussels consensus. Um, and, and one last point, I think I've also mentioned this before, there wouldn't be a political career that would survive in Tbilisi if they had, you know, if they refused um, uh, you know, NATO or the European Union. The fact of the matter is there is no European Union or NATO. And the European Union, I would give probably five, 10 percent chances. OK, just sort of geopolitically speaking, maybe maybe major powers in the region, Russia, for example, will acquiesce to the EU membership. But there, there will never be NATO in, in, in the South Caucasus. And everybody knows that. And so the idea that somehow Georgia refuses NATO or refuses the European Union is absurd. It's uh, it's laughable. Uh, they, they just would not survive politically if there came a government in Georgia in the future uh, who would actually say no to those things. The fact is, the, the prospect of Georgia realistically becoming a member of NATO, for example, just to focus on that organization, are, uh, are, are basically nil. And that's why they've realized that after these 30 years of rhetoric and narratives and propaganda, all they have to show for it is basically their own selves, their, how to survive on their own in a rough neighborhood. And, and, and even that is not being appreciated. So, um, you know, and, 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 it is, and this is, by the way, being done to the most loyal republic in the region. To the, you know, I've always said that, you know, this is this is United States and, and, and Brussels and, and Europe are doing this to the most loyal republic in the region, meaning in terms of in terms of its historic sort of political capital that it's willing to use only if the West accepts Georgia, you know, so but I guess it's just never enough. It's and it's tough to be neutral. A proper neutral country or or politics yeah. is always difficult because you're gonna get crap from both sides. That's just the nature of the thing. Um, Lasha Kasaratze, Alexander Mercuris, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Pascal. Bro.